Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and in this module we were discussing about the, uh, the uh, cell biology as well as we are discussing about the microscopy tools what is available to uh, perform the different types of experiments. So now in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the different experiments what you can perform with the help of the microscopy and I have tried to uh, make a make a problem like situation so that you will be understand under what situ problem you can be able to utilize the microscopy. So, let us start the uh, discussion about the different experiment what you can perform with the help of the different microscopy techniques. So, the our research problem one is uh, very simple that scientists have discovered a new bioactive phytochemicals from the neem tree. So, you know the neem tree right and now he wants to test its effects on to the propagation of the malaria parasite. So, what he wants to ask is that he has actually isolated a new bioactive phytochemicals and now he wants to test whether it is inhibiting the propagation of the malaria parasite or not. So, you know that the malaria parasite cause a disease called malaria and if you go with the uh, little background you know that the malaria parasite uh, requires the two host one is invertebrate host and the other is vertebrate host. So, in an invertebrate host you have the mosquito which actually bites to the other vertebrate organ uh, 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 host for example, the humans and that is how it actually goes from one body to another body. And within the uh, invertebrate host they have a complete life cycle through which the gametes are fusing with each other to produce the ovum and that is how they are actually producing the merozoites and then merozoites are being uh, con uh, so that, that is how they are uh, producing the sporozoites and these sporozoites are actually being injected by the mosquito to the human being and then these sporozoites actually goes into the liver and then it uh, completes its life cycle within the liver to generate the merozoites and these merozoites then infects the RBCs to call to form the different stages and all the all the stages what is present in the RBCs are called as the arthrostatic uh, life cycles. So, within the arthrostatic life cycle you have the different stages like uh, as I said you know once the merozoites are coming out from the liver. So, from the liver you are getting the merozoites and these merozoites are actually infecting the RBCs and then it is causing it is for it is forming the first stage which is called as the ring stage. Uh, so, this is the this is the typical ring stage what you see uh, after as soon as the merozoites enter into the RBCs. So, why it is called as ring stage because it is having a ring like appearances where the nucleus is on the one corner and then the cytosol is distributed and then ring stage is getting converted into the trophozoite states and then trophozoite is actually converting into the uh, schizones and the schizones are actually releasing the new merozoites and these new merozoites are again infecting the new RBCs. So, if you see the life cycle what you see is that the merozoites are infecting the RBCs. Uh, and these RBCs are then forming the ring stage and after the 10 hours the ring stage is getting converted into trophozyte stage and then from trophozyte it is actually causing the uh, production of the schizons and then from the schizons it is actually again releasing the so once once the RBCs containing the schizons is going to bust it is actually going to release these merozoites and then these merozoites are actually going to infect the new series of uh, uh, RBCs. So, what we really want to know is that if we actually treat the parasite or if we treat this particular uh, culture with the uh, phytochemicals, so whether it is actually going to uh, complete its life cycle or not. So, experimental design is very simple. The experimental design is that you can actually take the ring stage parasites and then you incubate that with the phytochemicals and you ask whether it is inhibiting the propagation of or the transformation of the ring and stage parasite to reach to the schizon stage parasites. So, typically what you have to do is you have to just first produce the ring infected RBCs uh, with the help of the synchronizations and then you incubate that with the help of the increasing concentration of the phytochemical or the test molecules 
and then you incubate that for some time and then after that you actually are going to make a smear after 34 hours so to see whether the ring is being matured to give you the shadow stage because under the normal circumstances it is actually going to complete its life cycle and that's how it is actually going to give you the shadows within the 35 hours uh, if you want to study the reinvasions then you again make a smear after 72 hours and that actually is going to tell you whether your compound is also having an effect on the reinvasions reinvasion means the shajons are going to release the myrozoites and these myrozoites are whether infecting the new rbcs or not because that's how it is actually going to give you the uh, new ring stage, rings rings uh, you can also ask whether the compound is the parastatic or the parasitical which means whether the compound is killing the uh, parasite or whether it is simply stopping the growth of the parasites that you can do simply by uh, the drug removal so what you can do is you can treat the parasite for the drug molecules or the test molecule for some time and then after that you actually can remove the parasite and keep it into the fresh media and let them to propagate so if the parasite is dead it is not going to propagate into the fresh media but if it is uh, only uh, you know stopping its growth which means it is uh, still be live then it will start making the growth so that is what you have to do when you just remove the drug you wash the parasite culture and then you, you put it into a new media and then you, if you prepare the smear after 72 hours if you see the viable parasites then actually it is going to uh, say that the compound what you were testing is the parasitic in nature means it is actually stopping the growth of the parasite but it is not killing the parasite so these are the three questions one you one can ask with the help of this microscopy based assays where one you can say whether the compound is killing the parasite or not whether the compound is uh, inhibiting the reinvasion event or not and whether the compound is uh, parasitic or the parasitical. So to, for, to performing these experiments you require the media like the RPMI 1640 cell culture media which we require to culture the malaria parasite. Uh, then you require the uh, Albumax 2 which is actually a, a powder which actually require for propagation of the malaria parasite. You require the 0.22 micron filters. You require the filtration units to prepare the media. You require the autoclaves. You require the vacuum pumps, and then you required a uh, upright microscope so that you can be able to visualize the parasites after the uh, different stages. Like if you can visualize after 34, uh, 35 hours or 72 hours, or after removal of the drug, you can be able to visualize the microscope with, the, uh, with visualize the parasite with the help of the upright microscopes. Uh, so, in the step 1 you have to prepare the ring stage parasite. So, the, so, so, this has been the first step where the parasite culture the mixture of different stages of the parasite is synchronized to the ring parasite containing RBCs. It has the following steps. So, the first step is that you have to prepare the ring infected RBCs so that you can be able to then incubate those ring infected RBCs with the test molecules and say whether the ring is getting matured to give you the chai joint after 35 hours or not. So, for that you have to prepare the ring stage and that you have to do with the help of the synchronizations. So, what you do is you take that 4 ml of a culture which is where you have the pestemia of 5%. So, what is mean by the 5% pestemia is that the 5 RBCs are infected out of the 100 RBC which you are going to count which means that is the 5% pestemia. So, you centrifuge the parasite culture at 72 G for to pellet down the RBCs and then you resuspend the RBC pellet with 4 ml of 5% sorbitol in distilled water and incubate for 10 minutes at room temperature and mix and shake it for 2-3 times. So, when you incubate this parasite culture with a 5% servitol, what will happen is that it is actually going to induce the lysis of the trophozoites as well as the shy joint containing a parasite. So, it is actually going to lyse all the RBCs which actually contains the trophozoite or the or the shy joints, but it is actually not going to affect the RBCs which contains the rings parasites. So, then you once you shake it for 2-3 minutes it is actually going to perform its actions and then you centrifuge the culture at 72 G, wash it for 3 times with media and bring the parasite to the 
5% hematocrit. So, you know that the 5% hematocrit means that the 5% of the RBCs out of the 100% volume, which means the only the pack volume of the RBC is going to be 5%. The normal blood has a hematocrit of 50%, which means the 50% is the RBC component and the 50% is the uh, plasma. So, in this case, we are taking only the 5% hematocrit. Uh, you repeat this, uh, you know, synchronization steps for two, three times because you know you you first time when you do the you know major chunk of the shy joint and the trophozoites are going to be lysed, and then you may still have some shy joint and trophozoite left. So then your rings are going to be formed, and you may have also the rings of the different ages as well because you can have the ring which is actually going to be formed after 2 hours, you can have the ring which is actually been of 8 hours. So, what will happen is in within another 4, 5 hours or 10 hours, you will see again you will start seeing the trophozoites. So, to, to make it very, very precisely the synchronized uh, culture, what you can do is you can do the synchronization with the help of the disorbital multiple rounds like first time you have done then you again culture it for another 48 hours then again you do it. So, if you repeat through three times you are actually going to bring only the ring containing parasites and that is good enough for performing this assay. Then you calculate the parastemia after the gymsa stain. The calculation of the parastemia we are going to discuss. So, parastemia you do not have to worry. Parastemia means the number of RBCs present in the 100 ml uh, uh, RBCs means number of parasite containing RBCs out of the 100 RBCs that is called as the pastemia and we are going to discuss about how to calculate the pastemia in a subsequent slides. So, now once you have prepared the ring containing RBCs then you have to do a preparation of the compound solutions. So, the test compound can be dissolved in the organic solvent at a concentration of 5 mg per ml. It is recommended to use DMSO as a solvent as it has no significant effect on to the parasite growth. So, if it is if it is a phytochemicals or if it is a water soluble compound then you do not need to uh, dissolve it into a organic solvent. You can simply dissolve it into a you know the aqueous media and then you can just uh, pass through to with the 0.22 micron filters so that it should be filter style otherwise what will happen is as soon as you will add the compound the bacteria will start growing. So, that actually is going to interfere with your assay system uh, and so in the step 2 you are going to prepare the compounds and then in the step 3 you are going to set up the assay. So, the parasite culture synchronized at ring stage by the disorbital treatment brought to the 1 percent parastemia. So, you remember that it was a 5 percent parastemia. So, whatever the parastemia you have you bring it to the 1 percent parastemia with the 3 percent hematocrit and in a total volume of 100 microliter you take the 50 microliter of parasite culture and it is mixed with the various concentration of the test compound like 0, 1.5, 3, 6.25. So, it is a serial dilution of up to 50 microgram per ml of a compound in 25 microliter and in the remaining you can add the complete media. So, in a in a in a recipe what you have is you have a 50 microliter of your you know the ring containing cells then you actually add the 25 microliter of the compound which is actually going to be of different concentrations and then you add the 20 microliter 25 microliter of the complete media and that is actually you going to incubate in into the uh, into the uh, incubators and let them to you know uh, uh, grow for another 48 hours in the presence of the compounds. Since you are doing all these experiments you have to add the chloroquine which is actually a anti malarial compound uh, as a positive control and you can add the solvent as a negative control. So, negative control is like whatever the solvent you are using if it is a you know aqueous solvents like PBS or buffer or whatever then you can add the buffers if it is a DMSO then you have to add the DMSO uh, and that will be a negative control and then you can add the chloroquine also so that it will tell you that whether the assay was working or not because the chloroquine is eventually going to kill the parasites. So, it is actually going to work as a positive control. Uh, incubate the compound for 48 hours then you monitor the appearances of the hemolysis or any other such effect. If, if there will be an hemolysis because because what happen is sometime you whatever the test compound you add it actually uh, does not have any uh, parasitic effect or it is does not have a parasitical effect but instead of that it actually uh, 
you know, uh, lies the cells and that is how actually it is going to interfere with your assay system. So, if that happens then you because if the RBCs are being lysed then there is no way that the ring are going to be propagate to give you chi joint and then chi joint is going to give you the mirojoite and then it is actually going to do a re -invasions. So, if you have any hemolysis, if you there will be any uh, lysis of the RBCs, then you have to stop the reactions and then you have to investigate which component of your assay mixture is actually giving you the hemolysis. If you can manage, because uh, sometimes what happen is the osmolarity of the different compound is also interfering with the osmolarity of the complete reactions and that is how it is actually causing the hemolysis. So, sometimes you may have to change your buffer systems and all that to take care of that. So, that is how you have to actually use the uh, stop the assay, but otherwise if you do not see any hemolysis then you can go on to the next step and you can monitor the growth of the parasite. So, in the step 4 you are going to monitor the step of the gro growth of the parasites. So, after the 48 hours uh, you are going to make a smear uh, and the parastemia has to be determined after the GSB staining. So, using a oil immersion objectives. So, uh, but, and these are the results what you are going to see. So, what you see is these are the healthy parasites. Uh, so, if there will be uh, no inhibition of the compound then what you are going to see is that the ring is actually getting converted into the all other stages of the parasites like you will see the trophozyte and shy jones and all that kind of thing. But if the ring is not being able to uh, convert into the shy joints or even if it get converted into shy joint but the shy joint is being dead then what you will see is actually a RBC which is actually going to have the fragmented cells like you are not going to see a clear uh, nuclear membrane and you will not be able to see a clear cytosol because for example in this case you see that it has a very you know discrete cell and it has a uh, two nucleus and it is very clean and clear, but in this case all these cells are actually fragmented. So, these are actually the appearances what you will see when the parasite is dead actually because uh, that is how it is actually does not have the nuclear membrane and the cytosol is also not very clear. So, that is how uh, it, it will say that whether the assay is working or not, but if you want to calculate the, uh, the growth of the uh, parasite then what you have to do is you have to count these cells under the microscope. So, you have to observe these cells under the 100x of magnifications and then you have to keep counting how many number of RBCs are ring containing, how many RBCs are of trophozyte and how many of shy joints and then you have to plot that and uh, using that particular data you will be able to determine the parastemia as well as whether the compounds are inhibiting or not. So, in the step 5 using that you can be able to calculate the IC50 which means the inhibitory concentration 50 of that compound. So, the number of shy joint containing RBCs were counted against each concentrations. The shy joint inhibition data from that in vitro uh, shy joint inhibition assay of the above compounds were fed into a specially pre-programmed excel sheets. So, you can actually be able to calculate using this excel sheet which is been available from this particular site. So, if you put all that shy joint containing cells and put it into this particular excel sheet you know automatically it is going to plot the curve and it will going to tell you the IC50 as well as the IC90 and all other kinds of parameters. You can add the chloroquine as a positive control and that actually is going to give you the confidence that the assay was working and there is no uh, you know the uh, flaws or there is no uh, issue with the uh, setup of the assay itself. Uh, to determine the nature of the action for example, the peristatic or the peristidal. So, peristatic or peristidal means that you have a you know a ring containing uh, parasite. So, what you will do is you will add the compound. So, if you add the compound what will happen is that it is actually going to seize the uh, you know the growth of that particular parasite. So, whether it is seizing because the parasite is uh, you know not getting the enough nutrition and in your you know the compound is somewhat interfering with the biochemical pathways and that is how it is decided that ok let us uh, you know reduce the metabolic activities and remain as a you know dormant stage. So, in that case the parasite is going to be remain live, but it is not going to 
grow actually because for growth it requires all those metabolic pathways to be act in an activated state. The other condition is that it is actually contain you know converting the parasite into a ring containing parasite but these rings are actually the dead. So, if they are dead then they are not going to give you the shy joint whatever you do actually ok. But if they are live and if you remove the compound which is then they are actually going to give you the shy joint which means they can be able to complete their life cycle. So, if they are being able to uh, you know the life and they will be able to complete then the compound is go going to be called as the peristostatic which means it is actually only inhibiting the growth of the parasite. But if it is converting the parasite to a dead parasite then the dead parasite will not going to complete its life cycle and that is how it is actually going to be called as the peristocidal which means it is going to kill the parasite. So, to determine that what you have to do is in, in a 100 microliter volume 3 percent hematocrit with 1 percent parastemia were exposed to the trial compound for 48 hours. After 48 hours the parasite were washed twice with complete media so that you can be able to remove the compounds and then you incubate for another 48 hours in a drug free media. So, once you keep it in a drug free media they are actually going to be free to you know grow. If they are alive they will grow, if they are dead they are not going to grow. So, then you are to going to prepare a smear and the parastemia can be determined with the microscopically with as we discussed like you prepare a smear then you count the th you know the 1000 cells which means the 10 fields actually and if you count the 10 1000 cells it will actually going to give you the uh, statistically significant how many number of infected RBCs were present and that is how way you are actually going to determine the parastemia. So, this is all about the uh, one problem where we have used the light microscopy and we have actually uh, uh, determined the uh, anti malarial activity of a test compounds. You can be able to modulate these kinds of assays and you can be able to even use it for some other applications. For example, even if you see what we have discussed, we have discussed about the malaria parasite. But if you want to change the conditions and you want to utilize the microscopes, you can be able to change it in accordingly and that is how you can be able to utilize it even for screening the compound for other assays as well. For example, you can use the even slightly derived version and you can be used to microscopy to measure whether uh, you know for even for cancer cells and all other kind of cells whether the cells are growing or not. Now, we will we'll discuss about the research problem 2. So, in the research problem 2 the scientists are routinely propagating mammalian cells and now what he, what the scientist has done it has developed a new medium which means it is he has developed a new media for cell proliferations. Now, what he wants, he wants to design an experiment to count the number of viable cells and number of dead cells which means he, uh, he has developed a new media and wa now what he wants is he, since he wants to test whether this media is good enough as it was already been established media compared to the established media and whether the number of live or the dead cells are more or less in the case of when when we when we they are using this particular new media for propagations. So, experimental design is very simple the you are going to use a, a dye which is called as the tripan blue. So, tripan blue is a charged dye and the viable cell exclude this dye to the presence of the membrane potential whereas, dead cell are actually going to accumulate the dye in the cytosol. So, what happen is you take the cells or you take the culture actually and then if you add the tripan blue what will happen is the tripan blue is actually going to be excluded by the cell because tripan blue is a charged dye. So, it, it requires some receptor or some other active processes through which the tripan blue can be taken up by the cell. But if the cell is dead because the cell is maintaining a you know a, a potential across the membrane and the dye has to neutralize that uh, potential then only the dye can be able to enter. But if the cell is dead the tripan blue is actually going to be entered into the cell and it is actually going to make the cell as 
the blue color. So, that is what you have to do. If you take the whole cell populations and if you stain it with the trypan blue, what you will see is that the some cells which have not taken up the dye and the some cells which are actually appeared blue. So, these are actually the live cells because they are actually opposing the entry of the dye into the cell because they have a active membrane potential and that membrane potential is opposing the entry of the compound. Compared to this, this is a dead cell and that dead cell does not have the required electrode, uh, the membrane potential and that is how it is actually going to allow the entry of the dye and the dye is actually going to accumulate into the cell. Uh, this is the uh, hemocytometer which actually you can use to count these cells uh, with the help of the microscopy. So, the material what you require, the material what you require is a glass slide, you require a cover slip, you require an inverted microscope with a phase contrast uh, provision like you require a face plate and the contra uh, and then you require a hemocytometer. Uh, these are the multiple steps. So, in the step 1 what you have to do is you have to remove the cells from the cell culture plate either by the trypsinization or by the 0.5 percent EDTA. Uh, so, this is the step 1 uh, and then you plate the small amount of cells on a glass slide and cover them with a cover slip. Then what you do is you take the mix uh, uh, 50 microliter of cell suspension with the 50 microliter of trypan blue solutions. So, 0.5, 0.4% and blue uh, solution is already available from the different vendors that you can buy and then you fill the hemocytometer chambers, observe the cell under the 20x objective using the inverted microscope with the face plate. So, viable cells appears colorless whereas the dead cell appear blue or the dark colored. The a hemocytometer is placed on the microscope stage and the cell suspension is counted. There is a V color notch. So, in the hemocytometer what you have is in the center you have a V color notch. So, on this V color notch you can actually uh, you know you, you through with that view V color notch you can be able to uh, you know uh, you can be able to load the hemocytometer with the cells and the cells are counted in the ch in the chamber and that gives the number of cells. In addition, the blue colored cell can be counted to know that the number of dead cells. So, in this particular procedure what you have to do is the first you have to trypsinize the cells. So, when you add the trypsin enzyme or you can use the EDTA, it is actually either going to chew up all the receptors what the cells are using to stick to the dishes or it is actually going to destroy the calcium. So, whatever the mechanism the cells are going to come off from the cell, uh, from the dish and then what you can do is you can just mix the 50 microliter of the cell with the 50 microliter of type and blue and then you load that onto the hemocytometer and then you put it under the uh, inverted microscope and then you can actually visualize these cells within the chamber and uh, you can be able to uh, you know count the number of blue cells and the number of colorless cells and that is how you can be able to count the number of dead cells and number of viable cells. So, this is all about the theoretical understanding of this process. Let me take you to my lab and uh, we are going to show you all these procedures and because the hemocytometer is a very very you know if you very uh, clearly see the in the inside uh, the structure it actually has a different chambers and then you have to do a counting in these different chambers so that you will be able to count the number of cells and number of cells and then you uh, ultimately you can be able to even calculate the concentration of the cell in per microliter of uh, number of cells per ml as well. Because that information is required if you want to plate a specific number of cells for a for an experiment. For example, if you remember when we were doing the uh, you know the when we were discussing about the phagocytosis experiments the last time we said that you have to plate the 10,000 cells. So, if you want to plate the 10,000 cells the first thing what you have to do is you have to put the cells into the hemocytometer, you have to count and then you have to convert that value into the concentration like 10 to power 6 per ml or 10 to power 8 per ml or so on and then accordingly you have to dilute and calculate that how many how much microliter of the cell suspension I should take so that it will give me the 10,000 cells per well. 
So that is also true for and all other assays like MDT assay and you know all other kind of assay what you do in your lab where you have to do a counting. So let us uh, understand how you can do the cell counting and how you can be able to determine what are the number of viable cells you have and what are the dead cells you have. Hello everyone, in this video we will show how to subculture the cells and count the cells. First we have to remove the remaining media, then trypsinize the cells, then we will count the cells and see it. Now I will show how to do trypsinization. Now, I am going to add the trypsin to detach the cells. After cells are de detached, we have taken into clean falcon, then we have to centrifuge the cells. As these cells are very delicate, we have to centrifuge at 1500 rpm for 2 minutes. Now we have to remove the supernatant and resuspend the cells in fresh media.
after recess fraction we have to count the cells so i am going to take 20 microliter of this cell suspension and mix with the 20 microliter of trypan blue and count under new bar chamber Before counting, we have to see how a counting chamber or hemocytometer look like. This is a typical hemocytometer also called as new bar chamber which contains these squares in upper side and lower side with each square having depth of 0.1 mm and area of 0.0025 mm square. Now I am going to put a cover slip on this chamber then I will add slowly cell suspension through capillary action it will spread all over the squares So we check the how many cells are there in all the squares. Now we have to count. How to count the cells? So here a typical new bar chamber which contains squares, five squares. So we have to count cells in these squares. So each square is an area of 0.0025 mm square and total small squares 16 so total area of this whole square is 0.04 mm square so the depth of the this each well is 0.1 mm so what what is the volume 0.04 into 0.1 so that is total 0.004 millimeter cube or 0.004 microliter so say we have combined cells in each well say this is a b c d here we have 100 here we have 150 here we have 110 here we have 100 again okay. So, the total cells, we have to take average, that means 
100 plus 150 plus 110 plus 100 divided by 4 total 4 squares we are counting the average is 150 so 115 cells in 0 0.004 microliter volume so how many cells per 1 ml so that we can calculate simply 0.004 into 1000 that will give the volume cells per ml so uh, in this experiment the student have discussed different uh, steps uh, related to the uh, cell counting and how you can be able to utilize the microscopes to determine the viable as well as the dead cells. They also have discussed how to calculate the concentration of your cells so that you can be able to use that information to uh, you know you know you can be able to use that information to uh, uh, put the cells as per the your requirements. Now let us move on to the next uh, problem. So the next research problem is that uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis H37RV is inhibiting the interaction between the phagosome maturation uh, and now you have to design a suitable experiment to study the interaction of the phagosome with the lysosomes. If you remember when we were discussing about the phagocytosis in our previous lecture, we said that the phagosome is formed when a particle is being taken up by the cell through phagocytosis. So, once a cell is being taken up a particle like for example, a bacteria in this case the mycobacterium tuberculosis, the, the, this particular particle is going to be phagocytose with the help of the pseudopodia and then ultimately it is going to be internalized. So, in the internalized thing what you have is you this is the bacteria what you have and it is being internalized by a membranous structure and this structure is actually being called as the phagosome and then eventually what happen is that you have the lysosomes in the cell. So, all the immune cells have the lysosomes. So, then these lysosomes actually fuses with these phagosome and this is a very very complicated and complex uh, process through which the phagosome actually interacts with the lysosomes and eventually developed and you know the lysosome fused and then when the lysosome is fused it actually uh, causes the release of its content and that is how the phagosome is lysosome is actually going to release its content and that is how lysosome is going to digest this material. So, lysosome is uh, you know lysosome's inner pH is around 2 and it also contains the different types of enzymes like hydrolases and proteases and all those kind of enzymes. So, all these enzymes are actually processing the cell. Uh, the bacteria whatever the uh, the uh, the immune cells have the engulfed and that is how it actually degrades the bacteria. But what happened in the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis it actually interfered in this whole process and eventually survived inside the uh, macrophages and that is how it actually propagate within the immune cells and that is how they will be able to rescued or survived from the action of the immune cells. So, this, what we supposed to do is we have to supposed to design an experiment to study the interaction of the phagosome with the lysosomes. So, in this experiment what you have to do is you have to first uh, you know form the lysosomes, uh, first you have to form the phagosomes and then you have to form the lysosomes and then you have to mix them together and then you have to ask them whether they are actually fusing or not in the presence of tuberculosis or bacteria or not. Or suppose you give the phagocytosis the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria itself for phagocytosis and then you study these interactions. So, we have already discussed about the experimental design where you have to first uh, you know form the phagosomes, uh, then you have to also form the lysosomes and how you are going to do a phagosome, you are going to form the phagosome, what you can do is you can simply uh, allow the cell to do a phagocytosis and phagocytosis if you do it is actually going to form the phagosomes. How you can be able to generate the lysosomes, what you can do is you can ask a cell to to drink some liquid for example, you can just go with the process of phenocytosis and if you do so whatever you liquid you will give uh, 
that will enter into the lysosome. So, for example, if I take a uh, fluorescent dye and if I add that dye to the to the cell culture media, eventually what will happen is the lysosomes whatever is going to be formed are actually going to be fluorescently labeled because this liquid what we are taking is actually going to be filled into the uh, lysosomes. Once these two are ready, then you can mix them and ask whether they are fusing with each other or not because if the mycobacterium has any effect or it is actually having some factors which are interfering into this, it is actually going to, uh, it, it, it will not allow the phagosome to interact with the lysosomes. So, the material what you require, you require the methanol and acetone that is you require for fixation, uh, you require the PBS that is only for washing purpose, then you require the Triton X100 that is for permeabilizations. you require the BSA, uh, you require the uh, you know epifluorescence microscopes, you require the 1 micron latex beads, you require the Philippines and then you require the rhodamine dextran. So, rhodamine dextran is a fluorescent uh, dye which actually going to allow you to form the lysosomes. Uh, so, the procedure what we require, the procedure is that in the step 1 you are going to do the identification of the phagosome or the you are going to prepare the phagosomes which you can uh, as per you know the provided by the your own material. So, what you can do is you can take the uh, J774, these are the macrophages cells, so these are the immune cells which you can uh, use for phagocytosis, so these are the macrophages. Uh, cells are cultured in a demium media containing 10 percent FBS and 1 percent uh, cocktails. Then you remove the cells from the cell plate by tipsonization or EDTA. You plate the 10,000 cells on cover glasses and incubate in a 24 well dish. You, uh, then uh, you incubate the cells overnight and allow the cells to attach to the cover glasses. Then you wash the cells with DMEM. Then you prepare a suspension of the latex beads like 10 to power 6 latex beads per ml in a DMM media. So, what you have to do is you have to maintain a ratio of 1 is to 10 in terms of the number of cells what you have taken and the number of beads what you have taken. So, you are going to provide the 10 beads for every cell to feed and then uh, you remove the media and add the suspension to the centrifuge and uh, so, basically what you are doing is in the step 1 you are basically doing the phagocytosis and that is how it is actually going to eventually form the phagosomes. So, these are the you know the wash the cells with this and that and then you fix the sample with the acetone and then you stain it with the Philippines. So, that actually is going to allow you to identify the phagosome because wherever you will going to see the object being encircled by a blue color fluorescence that is actually the phagosomes. Uh, and then you mount these cells uh, into uh, you know and you can be able to identify the uh, phagosomes. Uh, then step 2 you are going to do a labeling of the lysosomes. So, what you do is you plate the cells on a cover glasses in a 24 well plate grow them with a 100 microgram rhodamine dextran overnight in a DMEM plus 10 percent FBS plus antibiotic cocktail. So, what will happen is when you are going to grow the cells in a media which contains the rhodamine dextran. So, rhodamine is a fluorescent dye and it is coupled with a dextran. So, dextran is nothing but a polysaccharides. So, what will happen is the cell will start going to eat these uh, rhodamine dextran. So, when it will eat the eventually all the material will end up into the lysosome because you know that the primer, primary function of a lysosome is to digest the material what you have ingested or the, the, the uh, whatever the uh, you know the material is being ingested by the cells because ultimately you have to uh, you know you have to digest all that material generate the constituents I, uh, material like uh, suppose you digest the protein then it is going to generate the amino acid and then these amino acids are going to be supplied to the pro uh, to the cell for its uh, propagations or for nutrition. So, whatever the media you are using you use the same media you add the rhodamine dextran and then you let them to grow for overnight and that is how the uh, rhodamine is going to be end up into the lysosomes.
you wash the cells with PBS and then you are going to chase the sample for one hour. So what is mean by chasing is that you remove the rhodamine dextran and then you let the things to grow without uh, you know without rhodamine dextran. So what happen is in if you do so the last drop of the rhodamine dextran will also going to be end up into the uh, lysosomes because eventually everything end up into the lysosome because that is the way the cell has you know devised the mechanism so that whatever it drinks or whatever it eats it ends up into the lysosome so that it will get digested and you can be able to use the nutrient coming out of these digestions. Then in the step 3 you are going to set up the fusion assays. So you add the 10 microgram 1 ml latex in 0.5 ml media and spit at 1000 g for 2 minutes. Then you incubate for another 5 minutes in water bath. So when you do that in incubation in 5 minutes for water bath, it is actually going to induce the phagocytosis of these beads. Uh, and then you remove the beads and wash them twice with the PBS containing 37 degrees Celsius. The media is removed and fixed with the paraformaldehyde. Then your slides were visualized in the microscopes. So in the incubation assays, what you are going to do is you already prepared the lysosome in the cell. Then what you do is you add the latex beads to these cells and allow them to phagocytose. And once they are phagocytose, the phagosomes are already are being formed. Lysosomes are already been there because they are already been fluorescently labeled. And now what you can do is you can just do these incubations for uh, you know the multiple uh, time points like you can do 5 minutes, 10 minutes to, and up to 1 hour. In this process the phagosome will meet all the lysosomes and the lysosomes are going to be fused with phagosomes. So what will happen the when you visualize these cells under the microscopes what will happen is that if you observe the cells in a bright field and look, look for the beads onto the cells. So what you are going to see is you just visualize the cells under the microscope then you look for the beads under the bright fields. So observe the cells in the fluorescent microscope with the UV filters. If the beads has a blue fluorescence like in this case this is the bead right and it has a blue fluorescence around it which means this is actually a phagosome which is being formed already. Now once you saw the phagosome then what you can do is then the cells can be visualized through a red channel. So what you are going to do is first you select the bead what you want to visualize under the bright fields then you go with the blue channel. So in the blue channel it is actually going to give you a blue fluorescence around it and then you go into the red channel. So once you go into the red channel what you will see is that this blue colored uh, you know, blue colored uh, signal is also having a red color signal which means if you have the double signal like if you have the blue color ring and then if you have a red color ring around it which means these are the phagosomes which are actually having the lysosomes as well which means here the phagosome is being interacted with the lysosomes and that is how the phagosome has received the content from the lysosomes. So that is how you can be able to conclude that the phagosome is being now matured and it has formed the phagolysosomes. How you are going to analyze this? A typical phagocytosis of bead will represent by the appearance of the bead in the phase data which means this one and the same bead will be circled by a blue fluorescence from the Philippines. If the bead has also blue fluorescence ring and it further encircled by a red color uh, in ring indicate that the interaction of the lysosomes and phagosome is happening. You might see that some of the beads like for example this bead is also being formed and this bead is does not have any phagosomes. For example in this case you see this is the bead which is actually being internalized and you have a blue color fluorescence but for this particular bead you do not have any signal into the red. Uh, fluorescence which means this bead is only forming the phagosomes but these phagosomes are not interacting with the lysosomes. So that is how you can be able to study the interaction of the phagosome with the lysosomes and you what you have done is you have simply allowed the cells loaded with the lysosomal markers or the fluid, fluid markers so that the lysosomes are being labeled with a red color fluorescent 
and then you allow the cell to phagocytose the material and once it will phagocytose it will going to form the phagosomes and then it is actually going to interact with the lysosomes and wherever the phagosome is going to interact with the lysosomes you are going to see a bead which is circled by a blue color uh, ring and blue color ring is further follow uh, encircled by a red color ring. So, if you have two rings red and blue, so that is the place where the phagosome is being interacted with the lysosomes. So, with this uh, we would like to conclude our lecture here and in this lecture we have discussed the different experiments what you can be able to perform with the help of the microscopy uh, and I hope you might be able to design few more experiments uh, by after looking at the potential of these particular techniques and it may help you in designing the new experiment for your own work. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.